Official results from Sunday's presidential election in Democratic Republic of Congo won't be known for a few days, but both the opposition and governing coalition have already said they're on track to win. So will there be a peaceful transfer of power? This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the programme. I'm Laura Kyle. Congolese President Joseph Kabila has been in power for nearly 18 years, but he's now agreed to step down. Millions of voters went to the polls on Sunday to choose his successor after a more than two-year delay. The votes are being counted, but both Kabila's chosen candidate and the opposition are already claiming victory. The election was marred by widespread irregularities, including complaints of vote rigging and violence. The internet's been cut in an apparent attempt to stop speculation about the results. And people in some areas didn't get to vote at all because of fighting and an outbreak of the Ebola virus. We'll bring in our guests in just a moment. But first, Catherine Soy has the latest from the Congolese capital, Kinshasa. We've seen a very difficult election period here in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Let's start with the campaigns that were so chaotic. Um, some uh, presidential candidates denied from accessing certain parts of the country. Um, supporters violently dispersed by police using tear gas uh, and live bullets in some instances. Come voting day, there was so much disorganization in some polling stations we visited. Uh, voting machines were not working in some. There were no voters registered in others. People there are very, very angry indeed. We saw um, parts, uh, voters in parts of the country, particularly in the east, uh, that were unable to vote with the rest of the country. Those elections uh, for those in areas postponed uh, to March because according to Seni of an Ebola outbreak and security challenges there. So a lot of people here really do not trust the Electoral Commission, do not trust this process. They say that they don't believe that the vo uh, election is going to be credible and that is a big concern uh, to people I've been talking to. They're saying that if this election is contested then potentially there could be violence. We also saw President Joseph Kabila cast his ballot. I was at that uh, polling station and you know, a lot of people there uh, cheered him. This is an election that has you know, been delayed for two years and people thought it would never happen. People thought President Kabila would never step down. So this, that, that moment really was significant. But many of his critics are saying that, well, it doesn't really make a difference because he's uh, a personal choice. The ruling party candidate was Shadari. If he is declared winner, then it just means that President Joseph Kabila is going to continue running this country through Shadari. Let's bring in our panel now. And in London, Al Katenge, CEO of Innovation Task Force. In Paris, Marie-Roger Biloa, journalist and chief executive officer of MRB Networks. And also from London, Alex Vines, head of the Africa programme at Chatham House. A very warm welcome to all of you to the programme. Marie, let's start with you. This very much delayed election has eventually taken place on the 30th of December. But how legitimate was it? You know, this is... Uh, everybody believes uh, is the right thing to say that the election will calm and uh, because they had so much hope. Uh, into this election to sort of soothe all the, the problems happening in this country, uh, help uh, solve the plight of uh, DRC. But what we saw is something which doesn't seem very legitimate, the way they organize it. There is part of uh, the country which has been um, uh, eliminated, sort of, because... Mm. Uh, it's difficult to conceive that you, you held a presidential election in, 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 in two parts. Part of the country is not taking part. And, the, and also, uh, it was marred with all kinds of uh, logistical problems, with these uh, voting machines, with uh, whatever you can think of. So um, the only thing we can say that there was not too much violence, but uh, it's not sure that this electoral process will help solve uh, the political, the, the ongoing and, and standing permanent political crisis in mm. DRC. 
OK. Uh, Al, to what extent do you agree with that? I mean, many people, especially the opposition, are crying foul and they're saying that it was deliberately chaotic so that it can be called, so it can be annulled and, and called void. Do you agree with that? Um, well, when you look at this uh, electoral process as a project, you'd say it has been a very chaotic uh, process due to the fact that it has been done out of any transparency, no involvement of private sector and everything kept politically coloured, which means uh, it was really done on a way that nobody could trust it uh, specifically when you talk about opposition. And today uh, we see that uh, the contest is quite huge and uh, the outcome will not be accepted very easily. Alex, the DRC is a vast country. It's the size of Western Europe and it has very little infrastructure linking East and West and North and South. So why did the government refuse all international help in terms of financial and logistical aid? Well, uh, originally the government uh, did try and get international support and found it difficult to raise money. Mm. And so in the end, uh, it decided to fund these elections uh, on its own. So. Uh, you do have to accept that, I think. Um, but it's correct for the uh, other two uh, uh, guests on your program have highlighted the difficulties of, uh, of conducting a credible election uh, in a country like the Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, which is so massive, as you've said, the size of Western Europe and with appalling infrastructure. My own worry of this is that the government didn't accept uh, significant international monitoring of the election. So, for example, the European Union was excluded from deploying a very large, credible team across the country. And so that gets to the heart of this issue, which is whatever the result is of this election, uh, will, be, will Congolese trust the result? And that's the problem here. Uh, does this solve some of the political issues and move the country on? Uh, or does it set it back? Mm. Uh, and, and that's the big worry, I think. Uh, Marie, that's, that's actually absolutely true, isn't it? Because despite all of these challenges and logistical obstacles, very many people persevered and managed to cast their ballot. Their ballot. Will they accept the result that comes out in a few days' time? You know, the problem is uh, if uh, the Kabila government uh, uh, announced the victory of uh, its candidate, uh, of course, it will be massive rejection. Uh, massive. And probably there will be protests and demonstrations. But at the end of the day, um, after also a massive uh, repression, we can predict that the, this government, which is very much prone to violence, will resort to a, a, a crackdown. What we can see, we will probably see that, uh, well, after the protest, they will wait for the storm and um, continue business as usual and proclaim their own candidate. The incumbent president will proclaim its, its, its own candidate. And, um, well, and the international community, what you call the international community, um, probably will issue, you know, communiques saying things did not happen the, 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 the right way. But as we saw in many other countries like Gabon or wherever, uh, nothing will happen. And uh, that's the, the, the tragedy of the country, that the own uh, leaders are not really interested in, in, in change and uh, improving the situation, improving the lives of their own people, even you know, sort of improving the, the, the own economy. Mm. They just think of themselves and because they are serving foreign interests and those foreign interests are not interested in having a structured, democratic and transparent government regime in, in uh, DRC. OK, Al, do you share that pessimism? Do you think Joseph Kabila's chosen successor, uh, Shadari Emmanuel Ramazani Shadari is likely to be declared the winner and that no one is going to do anything about it? I'm just surprised about how people approach this election. These were just three elections in one presidential, national parliament, and provincial parliaments. And just to be frank with you, national 
parliament is supposed to raise the government and provincial parliament is supposed to raise the provincial government. I'm just surprised about the focus on the only presidential election. Just for your information, in Congo constitution, the head of state doesn't have that power we give to Kabila. It's a thing of the past. The next president will be very weak. So we need to understand that our focus should go to the parliament. My question is, if today uh, Shadari goes as a president and the majority of the parliament goes to the opposition, the a question will be very different. Mm. And the question today is, how is going to be the election at the presidential level and the parliamentary level? And then that's where we get the information and now we know how the, the, the future is going to be. Power, um, Alex, that's quite an interesting uh, take on it, isn't it? This, this shift um, of focus away from the one man in power to the parliamentary system, not something that we've seen very much of in the DRC. Do you think that, it is, that now is the time for that side of the power to rise up and, and take charge? Well, there are three things here. One is obviously the credibility of this process. Uh, will uh, opposition parties be able to get a majority in the assembly if it's a, a free-ish election, even with the problems that were discussed? We'll see that pretty soon. Uh, I tend to think that a, a massive systematic fraud is, is, is very difficult to achieve in Congo, given the atmosphere and scrutiny of civil society activists and others. Uh, and so I think it's probably right that we'll see a much stronger uh, coalition of opposition parties uh, within the parliament. Uh, then the question is, can they work with each other? I mean, they failed to unite around a presidential mm. candidate. They were united for less than a day. Uh, and that's been one of the problems, I think, of the opposition is division. Uh, and then thirdly, I think it's wrong to think that, uh, that, that people want instability in Congo. Certainly the international community wants stability. And the two major powers with the greatest amount of influence in Congo are probably South Africa and Angola. And both uh, are driven by stability in the Congo. So they will have some influence over this process too, I suspect, although much of this will be determined inside uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo itself. Alex, let's just uh, touch on how much leverage those countries, the international community as a whole, will have in uh, the, the, the aftermath of this election. Well, look, I don't think the West has a tremendous amount of influence. And the EU ambassador was, pu was, was, was uh, pushed out of the country before the elections. Uh, the Congolese government, uh, the DRC government made that quite clear he was unwelcome. But I do think some of the neighbours have, have, have influence. I've mentioned Angola and South Africa. I think they can play a positive role at times in the Congo. Uh, and then there's mischief in, uh, in Eastern Congo, where you have some proxy wars going on in Eastern Congo with rivalries between Burundi and Rwanda, for example. And that, that, can, that sometimes can be positive, but often it can be more negative. Marie, would you agree with that? We were pretty pessimistic earlier about the immediate future for DRC, but is there room perhaps for a positive impact? You know, I, I like the idea that uh, African countries, uh, especially na neighboring countries maybe, and probably also uh, South Africa, might have a positive influence uh, in, in solving uh, the Congo problem. But uh, I think it's, so far it's just a dream because those are two actors who have not the major stake there. You know, you have... Uh, uh, companies, huge mining companies with uh, uh, an intricate set of, of uh, uh, actors um, we, which are stronger than any government. And not only in DRC, you see what you call our, our global world, uh, where uh, some companies, major companies, are stronger than nations, than uh, uh, public governments. So. In Congo, this is very much so. And uh, we mentioned two actors, uh, Angola, South Africa. But there are also Rwanda, or there are also uh, Rwanda, who is very influential, uh, which has its own agenda there. So how can you um, uh, solve the problem or, or, or pull all these to uh, people together uh, and to have a common goal? 
in in uh, DRC, which which seems the, the, by now very very difficult. Mm -hmm. And when you hear about the uproar or the uh, uh, unstable situation in eastern Congo, so you have Rwanda has very much its hand in it. Uh, what South Africa does does not. And let me give you another example of the weakness of African countries. Um, prior to the election, there was a meeting uh, in uh, Brazzaville, you know, next door, where they tried to sort of uh, influence the, the not to uh, choose, an, choose uh, a, a candidate, but to to make sure that everybody, everything will happen in a proper mm, way okay. and that uh, the electoral process will lead to a, a clear leadership. And mm. uh, they, they, the Congo did, uh, DRC did not even attend it. And so it has no impact whatsoever. So the okay. problem is, uh, and I also I beg to, dis to disagree on the, on, on, uh, on the opposition, which is divided. Uh, I think they made a great, great effort uh, in choosing one candidate, even if that agreement did not last very long. Uh, what we saw at the end is that the Martin Fayulu, who was uh, uh, appointed common candidate, was clearly the, 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 the leading candidate in that election. And uh, if we can believe the polls, He's really outstanding. Okay. So, well, let's, let's, just, let's look at him a little bit. I'm going to jump in there to bring they, Alan they to look so at Martin Fayoulou. He has promised better governance. Let's go back to the parliamentary system that you were talking about earlier. Can he deliver on that? Can he shape Congo to be better? Th thanks very much for this question again. Let me tell you, I personally know Martin Fayoulou is a brilliant guy. But let me tell you again that Congolese constitution says... The government comes from the majority at the assembly. If today Martin Fayolo wins this poll and he doesn't have the majority at the assembly, then unfortunately he will not be able to do anything. Mm. Just for your in information, the main specific tasks of the head of state in Congo is in foreign affairs and military affairs. The rest is supposed to be in hands of the prime minister who is issued from the uh, majority of assemblies. So, uh, again, let's just don't focus on one person. And the solo going management in Congo is now ending with uh, Joseph Kabila, which I think is the main important thing that we get out of this election. Is it ending, though? If we have Shadari replacing him, will we not just see more of the same strongman politics? The, the, the only thing that can keep Shadari doing the same thing is that if Shadari takes the place, and the parliament is totally controlled by the same political group, then they can maintain the, the situation. If not, then I'm sure there's a change time. It's a game changer time. OK. Alex, let's just look at some of the challenges that are facing DRC. We've got the second deadliest outbreak of Ebola in history in parts of the country. All this election uncertainty, what does it do when it comes to tackling that major health crisis? Well, the Democratic Republic of the Congo historically has uh, uh, some of the best international learning and experience on combating Ebola. Um, in fact, it's been a shame at times that the Congolese experience hasn't been used elsewhere. Um, it was ignored for a while when there was the crisis in the Mana River Union, West African countries of Guinea, Sierra Leone and Liberia. Um, this is the second deadliest outbreak, and it, it's obviously horrible timing that it overlaps with an election. Uh, but I do think that uh, the Congolese have experience, they have expertise, they have international goodwill to work with them. Uh, and so I think this is something that we'll probably see uh, a, a key focus in, in 2019. Uh, I, I would say it's one of many problems in the Congo, uh, but it's not the primary one. The okay. primary one, I think, is about uh, the politics that the country is facing right at the moment. OK, and of course, another one is the security situation. There's plenty of armed militia groups along the borders. Marie, how fragile is that situation? And again, in these uncertain times, how can that be exploited? Uh, you know, the security issue is uh, linked to the governance issue. Uh, as, as long as you don't have a legitimate uh, power in Kinshasa, 
uh, which everybody recognizes, um, you will have that weakness uh, at the extreme parts of the country, especially in the eastern part, where uh, you have all most of, of the wealth, the mining wealth, and as we know. Um, the, the, one of the, the, I would say, the main point or, uh, of uh, this uh, ruling government is that they, those, they don't even control, I would say, one-third of the, the territory. So that was part of the challenge to organize an election uh, in that huge country, even, uh, and, you know, if you take a, a regular African country, it's still a, a huge challenge to uh, uh, organize elections. So imagine what it is for uh, a country which is uh, uh, larger than uh, Central Europe, mm. uh, with no infrastructure, with nothing. And so the border issue is, is part of all this, you know, as a, there's no the governance is too weak. The the central power is too weak. So everybody feels empowered to uh, to to start wars at, uh, and, okay. and do whatever you have. You know this appeal to chaos is very strong. Oh, the, the ethnic violence, at Ebola. They were used as as reasons for a complete vote postponement in three well key opposition areas. We've got Beni, Butembo, and Yumbi. Do people there accept those reasons to not have their vote? I think, I believe it's not going to be held until March. What impact is that likely to have? Today it's done, and unfortunately, these people have been isolated. And I hope in the next three months they will be able to vote for their own members of parliaments. And this is behind us. But what I'm saying is that uh, the country is huge, as this analyst has been saying. And that's why I've been insisting on the fact that we had three elections, one of them being provincial uh, assembly, which generates uh, the uh, provincial government with the governor elected among them. The, the most important thing we need to understand is that Congo is a decentralized uh, nation per definition, per constitution. And that's where we need to go so that we have local management to solve the local problems. And if we don't do that, should it be eastern part of Congo or southern part of Congo or the rest of the Congo, it will be mismanaged because it can't just be managed from Kinshasa. And that's where the Constitution said very clearly that we are a decentralized country and these elections were three elections in one. And it's important that we give the importance of each of these elections and so that we understand that mm. this is a change time and we will not have one person sitting in Kinshasa doing everything because okay. it's shown to be very limited in terms of results. So, Alex, it, how likely are we then to see Congo's first democratic transition of power, if not at the top, then at these lower levels that Al's talking about? Well, look, Al is absolutely right, and it's why we keep hammering the point, I think, all three of us, that, that, that coalition politics is going to play a very prominent role in terms of uh, Congo's future. There's no doubt uh, many Congolese want a prosperous uh, and stable future, uh, and uh, how you unlock that with coalition politics, both at the central level but also at the provincial level, is going to be the pathway forward. Uh, We'll see. I mean, it's been difficult at times for the opposition, as I've already highlighted, to, to, to reach a common platform. Um, but the dynamics within the assembly may well force uh, pulling together. Mm. Um, I'm not so worried if we have a symbolic, uh, weak uh, central president in the country. Uh, it's not a bad thing to see an end of, of uh, strong man politics uh, within Central Africa if that's what happens. Uh, and in the Democratic Republic of Congo in particular. Uh, but it will need a much more assertive political class that will have a longer-term developmental vision. OK. Uh, and, uh, well, the election results will have to show us whether that's possible. Absolutely. We'll be watching very closely indeed. Many thanks to all our guests for joining us today, Al Katenge, Marie-Roger Bilola and Alex Vines. And thank you too very much for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website, that's aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page, that's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter, the handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Laura Kyle, and the whole team here in Doha, it's bye for now. <laughs>